and find your seat. It is so good to have you today on a, a special Sunday, especially if you might be a first-time guest with us today. We, it's our privilege that you're here. And today is a, a day that we love to celebrate because on the first Sunday of each month, we take communion together. And uh, every time we do this, um, I like to say something about some aspect of communion. Uh, so many things could be talked about. And today, I want to specifically share a few thoughts on the subject of Christ's resurrection. Because when we take the Lord's Supper together, yes, we're celebrating his death, but we're also celebrating his resurrection. And so for just a few moments, I want to ask two questions before we take the elements together. The first question I want to ask is, does the Bible teach that the Christian religion stands or falls with Christ's resurrection? Does the Bible teach that the Christian religion stands or falls with the resurrection? And the second question I want to ask is, why is the resurrection directly connected to our justification? Why is the resurrection directly connected to our justification? So today we're taking a, a, a small break from our series on Shaped by the Word, Led by the Spirit, and we're going to talk about the resurrection for a few minutes. So let me invite you to take a Bible and turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go easy on you today. If you turn to 1 Corinthians 15, you can just stay there all morning. You don't have to turn to other passages. I'll say them for you, but if you just turn to 1 Corinthians 15, I'll let you just sort of relax into this chapter. And as you're turning to 1 Corinthians 15, I want to ask this first question, does the Bible teach that the Christian religion stands or falls with the resurrection. Look with me at verse 14, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 14. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain, and your faith is in vain. So question, does the Bible teach that the Christian religion stands or falls with the resurrection? Yes, it does. Paul just said it very clearly in verse 14. And so I want us to notice that 1 Corinthians, uh, interestingly, we've been in 1 Corinthians through the, the many series that we've been doing, and Paul addresses a number of problems, doesn't he? Um, the church at Corinth was an interesting church. Uh, he addresses the problem of Christians suing one another. He addresses the problem of sexual immorality, even incest, not out in the world, but among the members of the church. He addresses the problem of people, again, using spiritual gifts in a way that was not edifying to the whole body. Some were flaunting their gifts before others. He addresses numerous problems of idolatry and a lack of sensitivity in this church. He even addresses the problem of them coming to the Lord's table, having drunk too much wine and being drunk. And so there are issues with this church. But I want you to notice what chapter he begins talking about the resurrection. He talks about it at the end. He talks about it beginning in chapter 15. And by saving his comments about the resurrection for the end of the letter, it's as if Paul wants this to make a lasting impression. He's saying there are a lot of problems you're dealing with, but chief among them is this idea that some of you got from the Sadducees that says that there's no resurrection at all. And so Paul spends a great amount of time saying, hey, one of the many problems with saying that no one is resurrected is that that would mean that Jesus wasn't resurrected. And so for verse after verse, beginning in chapter 15, 
he starts talking about how difficult of a problem that would be for those of us who are believers in Christ. There would be no Christianity without the resurrection. And of course, making this point, Paul has it connected to another question, and that question is how can sinful man be reconciled to God? And Paul is making the point that the resurrection is not some optional belief, it is a historic reality that Christianity hinges on concerning us being reconciled to God. We've all sinned against him, and we all rightly deserve his judgment. And Paul is saying, without the resurrection, we have no hope of being reconciled to God. In fact, look at verse 17. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 17. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. In other words, no forgiveness for anyone. We're still at enmity with God if Christ has not been raised. And again, just to kind of give some proof text of, of how this is not the only place where Paul puts together the importance of resurrection with forgiveness of sins. Listen to Romans 10, 9. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that what? God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Also Romans 4, 24. Christ's righteousness will be counted to us who believe in him, who raised from the dead Jesus our Lord, who was delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification, our salvation. One more, Romans 8, 33. Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised. And so for Paul, again, resurrection is not some minor detail of the Christian religion. It is what hinges everything together. Without the resurrection, not only is Christianity null and void, but we're to, look, we're to be looked down upon. He says that in verse 19, look at it, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 19. If in Christ we have hope in this life only, in other words, if there's no resurrection, we are of all people most to be pitied. In other words, we've spent our whole life following a pipe dream. We've spent our whole life living for something that was just a legend. We of all people are to be pitied. Let me ask a silly question. It's a hypothetical question, but I'm asking this silly question for the purpose of making a point, and that is this. If somehow it was discovered today, either through textual evidence or archeological evidence or even bringing DNA into the picture, if it were somehow discovered that Jesus was never raised from the dead, would we as a church be able to continue to exist? I know that that's a silly question, but we as a church would sadly cease to exist. And as your pastor, I, with tears in my eyes, would announce, okay, everybody knows through the news, through all of the uh, articles that have been written, Every pastor knows it. If, if somehow there was indisputable evidence and everybody in the world knew it, that Christ was not raised from the dead, I would have to come up here on a Sunday morning and announce, in tears, we're done as a church. Not only are we done, but according to Paul, we're to be pitied that we believed this for so long and yet the resurrection never happened. And myself and the elders would have a discussion about how to dismantle our church. We'd have to take all of the objects in our room and in our building and donate them to a 501c3. We would lock up the church permanently. And 
It just so happens there's a dumpster in the back of the parking lot, and every one of us could drive past that dumpster, and we could drop our Bibles inside. It would be over. That's, that's how important the resurrection is in Paul's mind. Let me ask that hypothetical, again, silly question another way. If discovered that Christ wasn't raised, would we still meet as a church? That's actually a pretty good litmus test today for whether or not a church is really a church. Because if that was discovered, could I say, sadly, there are some churches that would continue to meet as if nothing had happened. You know why? Because today they do not believe in the resurrection. Today they believe, well, that's just a take it or leave it thing. Maybe he did, maybe he didn't. I mean, after all, there are some really smart theologians like Rudolf Bultmann and others who said that for the disciples, many of them believe that Jesus just fainted, he swooned, and then when he shows up again, he just led a good example. And so, in a way, in a, in a mythological sense, Jesus is raised in our hearts. He inspires us to live better. We all can overcome the challenges before us, like Jesus overcome, overcame this challenge of almost dying. And so, for many Christians, they Christians, I say that with scare quotes, for many churchgoers, they unfortunately believe that the historical, physical resurrection of Jesus is just a, a possible legend. We don't really need it. Maybe he did, maybe he didn't, but what really matters is that in our hearts, he inspires us. You ask me how I know he lives, he lives within my heart. Folks, if that's all we can say, that's inadequate. Jesus physically and historically rose from the dead, and the Apostle Paul is making this crystal clear, if he didn't, not only are we to be pitied as people who fell for the greatest hoax of human history, but we are still in our sins. I want to, before we go to the second question, I want to quote something that a student said about his college campus, and I'm sort of chasing a rabbit trail here, going off on a, a trail, but it, it is sort of related to what I'm about to say, but this is an actual quote from a college student. God's spirit is still doing wondrous things for us. Almost everyone is awakened. Our prayer meetings are filled to overflowing and are characterized by great earnestness and power. Those who have lately found Christ are very earnest in leading their friends to seek him. Another friend on the same college campus said this, no class on our campus ever passed through its four years without experiencing a revival. Our class formed no exception. Our revival came near the end of our junior year, and scarcely anyone in the class was left unchanged. Both of those students were in classes at Princeton University in the late 1800s. And for decades, Princeton University was known as the anchor of biblical faithfulness for our entire country. For decades, Princeton University and its adjacent seminary was known for Orthodox Christianity for our entire country. And one of the reasons for that is because the professors who taught there. And one professor was a man by the name of Gerhardus Voss. Gerhardus Voss immigrated to the U.S. He was a Dutch theologian in 1881, and not long after he got to the U.S., he began teaching at Princeton Theological Seminary. And the reason I'm mentioning him here is because I want to ask this next question. First, we asked, 
Does the Bible teach that the Christian religion stands or falls with the resurrection? Answer, yes. But here's the second question. Why then is the resurrection so important? Why is it directly connected to our justification? Because that's what Paul is saying. And I'm picking on this professor from Princeton because in a sermon in chapel on Easter in 1905, he said some things that I've recently read, and I thought, I'm going to borrow what he said for this point because it's too good. Voss said this, What is it that the resurrection contributes to our becoming righteous in the sight of God? I think we can put the answer in the most simple form by saying the resurrection stands related to righteousness in the same way that death stands related to sin. Read that last part one more time. The resurrection stands related to righteousness in the same way that death stands related to sin. If you were to read all of Paul's letters and count up how many times he uses the word death, you're going to discover something. For Paul, death was personal. That is, it almost carried a personification with it. Paul talked about death as being able to reign. He talked about death as if it was on the throne or something, as if it had a personhood. He talked about death as having dominion. He uses that word. He talked about death as the quote-unquote last enemy. Paul even talks about death having power and having a ministry. Of course, it's a negative ministry. Why? Why did Paul talk about death with a capital D? Was it because, for Paul, he's just a biological creature? Like every biological creature on this planet who will cling to life? I mean, kind of a survival of the fittest type of thing. If you observe nature, you're going to notice that every animal from a, a lion to a badger to a whale strives to live. There's something of instinct within every living being. No, that's not why Paul said all of that. Did he view death like that because he personally hated pain? And Paul knew that pain and disease and suffering led to death, and Paul wanted a life of comfort as much as possible. He didn't like pain just like any of us. Is that why he talked in such a personified way about death? No. It's simple. Paul talked about death this way because he equated it with sin. He equated death with guilt. In fact, he would have memorized as a boy Ezekiel 18.20 that says, The soul who sins shall die. Paul would have known Genesis 2.17. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil... You shall not eat, God is talking to Adam and Eve, for in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. For in the day that you disobey, for in the day that you sin, you shall surely die. Death is the representative of sin. For Paul, death is the representative, it's the perfect poster child for guilt. Because of that, Those other reasons that people die, whether it's suffering or disease or just old age, of course, Paul didn't like that, but death, capital D, was something else. He talked about it as the enemy because it was related to sin. Um, A few weeks ago, our family took a a family trip, a little family vacation to uh, New Orleans and we did a lot of driving down there and and back up and on this road trip I got a speeding ticket and nobody likes that 
Uh, it was expensive. Uh, something else happened on the trip, car related. Uh, at some point, I got a nail or a screw in my tire. And because of that, uh, it, didn't event, it didn't immediately deflate, but day after day after day, I knew I was gonna have to tend to it. And it ended up that I was gonna need two tires changed because of this trip and because of the wear and tear on these two tires. And so when we got home, I've got two expenses to take care of. Uh, I've got around $200 to take care of this ticket, but I also have around $200 to take care of two new tires. And I wasn't looking forward to either one of them. However, every time I thought about replacing the tires, it was just kind of a, an inconvenience. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm gonna have to do that, I've done it before, it's gonna, gonna have to wait at the tire place and be sure I've got a good book. Uh, we, none of us enjoy things in our house or a car breaking down. And so in my heart, it was just a normal inconvenience. Of course, I hate to dip into $200 that we really don't have, don't want to spend, but okay, I'll do it. But when it came to meditating on the ticket, not only was it an inconvenience, but every time I read that citation and looked at the address and tried to figure out how I was going to pay for this, I felt slimy. Why? Because every time I thought about that $200, I realized I was guilty. I'd broken the law of Louisiana. I had gone against Romans 13 that says you're to abide by the law of the land. And so when I thought about the $200 for my tires, eh, inconvenience, but I would get it taken care of. But when I picked up that citation, every time I looked at that $200, there's just this cloud that came over me, and I wanted to get it over with quick. You know, if your Bibles are still open to chapter 15, look at verse 56 with me. Verse 56, Paul says, the sting of death is sin. For me, the sting of that ticket was sin. Again, for Paul, death is not just an inconvenience. Death is not just a biological, things in this earth are wearing down. Although that's true. And, and, and I'm sure Paul wanted to avoid pain. All of that's an inconvenience. But for Paul... Death with a capital D was directly related to your sin, my sin, and his sin, and Adam and Eve's sin. And so if death is the representative of sin, what is resurrection? Listen to your hardest voss one more time. This quote is a little bit longer, but listen carefully. Now, if this is the significance of death in general, it follows that the death of Christ in particular must be interpreted on the same principle. Christ was made sin on our behalf. When he assumed our guilt, it became inevitable that not merely some general form of suffering entailed by sin should fall on him, but also that he must die. But if this is so, then the significance of the resurrection immediately springs into view. Christ's resurrection is the practical declaration on God's part that the curse has exhausted itself. The penalty has been paid to its bitter end and that in consequence, the dominion of guilt has been broken, the curse annihilated forevermore. Forevermore. What is Professor Voss saying? He's saying if death is the representative of sin, resurrection is the, resur is the representative of perfect life, new life, forgiveness, 
And not only is resurrection the representative of new life forever, but it's the representative of us being reconciled to God, which never changes for all of eternity, never changes for those who believe. And so this morning, I want to ask you, have you believed upon Christ? Can that be said of you? Because if you've believed in Christ, guess what death is? It's just an inconvenience. If you've believed on, on Christ, we don't deny death. We don't live, you know, in fear of it or, or in ignorance of it, say, oh, that'll never happen to me. No, that's not the Christian. The Christian sees death for what it is, but it's an inconvenience. And, and I don't also, also don't want to downplay suffering. For many, because of disease or whatever, if you're a Christian, that might lead to death, and we don't make light of suffering, but it's momentary. It's just a blip on the radar screen. And if we don't suffer, then it's just an inconvenience. It, it means that my, at my funeral, my children and grandchildren may have to take a day off work to come to my funeral. That's an inconvenience. I'll have to do some planning, make sure my will is in order and that ever, ever all of my possessions are divided up. All, all of that's an inconvenience. But guess what? As Paul says, oh, death, where is your sting? All death is for the Christian is an inconvenience because death's sting is gone. We've been reconciled with God not just because of the death of Jesus, but because of the resurrection of Jesus. So for the next few moments, I want to invite us to go to the communion table. And we're going to celebrate it this morning, not only by meditating on the death of Christ, but also by meditating on the resurrection of Christ. So beginning with the back few rows and coming this way, if we would just start to make a line at the communion table, and um, after we all sit down together, then we will eat and drink together.
the words of the Apostles' Creed are special to us because they link us with Christians through many centuries of the faith. And so if these are words that you believe in your heart, I want to invite you to say them out loud with me. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Paul later writes in the very same book that we've been reading from, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's take together. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you declare the Lord's death until he comes. Let's drink together. Oh, Father God, what a joy and privilege it is this morning that we can say with Paul, with boldness, Oh, death, where is your sting? There's nothing to fear because of the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord Jesus. Father, this very week, would we go from this place with that same joy in our hearts and as we shine it for others in the world to see, Would we be agents of sharing and spreading that gospel message to others in the precious name of Jesus? Amen. Let's stand together. And if you would take the hand of someone.